SDI group is focused on the design and manufacture of scientific and technology products for use in digital imaging and sensing and control applications company is listed on AIM where it currently has a market cap of £173 million. I'm joined by the Chief Executive Mike Creedon. So Mike, good to have you here. And so that we can visualise what it is that you create. If I was to see an SDI group product on the shelves, what would I see? Well, we're, we actually uh, sell products across many different sectors. So it's all within the science and technology based businesses. A good example is uh, we produce cameras for the, new, for the PCR machines. We actually produced flow meters, which went into the ventilators when COVID first hit us. We produce colony counters, counting bugs on a dish like E. coli, salmonella. We produce dosing equipment, which goes into the canning industry, making aluminium cans for uh, beer and uh, high energy drinks. So across many different sectors. I'm today at Centec, which makes alkaline to acidity sensors, the brewery, swimming pools, et cetera, et cetera. So many different sectors. So whereby if, uh, if we do have a, uh, a blip in profitability on one business, a good example is, I'll be honest with you, is Shell, as its major customer is Rolls-Royce and there's not many planes in the sky. Um, then it's always picked up by someone else. And you can actually see from the recent RNS, this is Attic Cameras, which has been really sort of a, a fantastic business, a fantastic story. So you mentioned the PCR test element there. Yeah. So how did you weather the unusual COVID times and how have you adapted your business model? Because it sounds as though you've been a beneficiary of the pandemic. Uh, we have across, uh, we've got 10 businesses now, we acquired one two, sort of two weeks ago. So uh, some have been good, some have been bad, but across the board, it's been brilliant from our results. But for my background, I'm an accountant by training. So my area is turnarounds. So as soon as COVID hit us in March, 2019, the, what we had to do was to make sure we have enough cash to survive. So we drew down all the money off HSBC. My finance director is from a big company called Amatech, billion dollar firm. He's never been involved with this, but I have from a small company business. So drawing down that, doing weekly cash flows, and it soon became apparent very quickly that we were going to survive because COVID actually was very good for a number of our businesses. So uh, very quickly, we took away the uh, weekly reporting from the subsidiaries and also cash. And uh, it became very uh, apparent that we were very profitable and cash generative during this period. OK, before we get on to the numbers, SDI Group is very acquisitive. So what type of company deserves to be part of your portfolio? What credentials do they need to have? Well, first of all, I think we've acquired 14 businesses since February 2014. I produce, I do all the DD myself. That, that's my job, uh, apart from business in subs. So really, you have to find out whether it's the right fit for us. You know, I come to work in a pair of jeans and I'm straightforward. You know, there's no politics uh, in the business at all. So that's number one. Number two is, if the founders are going to retire, then we do need some succession planning in place. So we have to be open on about it. Number three is they have to be profitable, but more importantly, they have to be cash generative. We don't buy blue sky cash fund businesses. And uh, number four is science and technology stands on the business. But there is one business we did acquire, which wasn't that, and that was in, uh, in metal fabrication. But a lot of our businesses uh, make metal cabinets. So it was an ideal opportunity by a fabrication business uh, within uh, in Somerset. So we'll look at anywhere. We'll look at anywhere in the UK, anywhere in the world, but currently it's in the UK. And we do offer a fair price. So we offer cash. No, uh, sometimes it's an earn out and it's usually between four and six times profit before tax. And we don't mess around with the buyers like private equity or the Americans, whereby we'll give an offer at the price, uh, a fair offer, and we won't change from that offer. I will either walk away saying it's not for us, but I will not quibble about a deal. So the price is there and it's in stone. So there you go. You're straight as a, a, as a die. And I'm quite sure when people find out that you're knocking on the door to buy them, then they know exactly what they're going to get. So in terms of the numbers, you said there that it was obvious quite quickly that you were going to survive COVID. But in terms of the last investor update, what did the numbers reveal? a robust business model? Well, robust, organic growth. We always like to achieve organic growth. 
I think people expect us to achieve organic growth uh, and also uh, acquisitions. I, I never read the blogs or look at the share price really, but um, people were actually telling me we hadn't actually acquired a business for 11 months. But um, we have to make sure that the business is right for us. It has to be the right fit. So the due diligence process will ca we carry out. It's about a week to two weeks actually on site. Um, and uh, what we try to do is to go through a very precise mechanism of buying businesses. I think the benchmark of not doing it right is HP and autonomy. So what we don't want to do is to go through that process. Um, so we buy nice niche businesses and uh, they are either st a standalone autonomous unit, which is what the founders like, and we invest in those businesses, or we actually integrate them. I think there's only two occasions where we've integrated two businesses. That was Fivestream, whereby we knew the founders were going to retire. That was integrated into Synoptics. And the other one was a chiller business called Thermal, Thermal Exchange, and we integrated that into Applied Thermal Control. They're only 10 miles apart, so we found a, a nice factory unit and put the, the two together. So you have a loan facility, you have a good relationship with HSBC, but I'm wondering how reliant you are on the loan facilities and placings to keep going at the pace that you've set. We've had two placings, no, sorry, three placings since I've been here. That was the first acquisition, which really put us on the map. That was Centec, that was eight per share, EIS, VCT money. Then we... That was in 2015. 2016 was at Astles at 13 per share. And then we raised money about four to five years ago for Graticals. We didn't need the money. It was just to get a bigger shareholder base. And from then on, we generate probably 10 million pounds a year in cash. So what I wanted to try to do uh, before John arrived was to have a facility. We generate cash, but we can never raise enough money to put in the piggy bank to go out and buy a business. So what I needed to do was to use the bank facility. So they arranged a, a facility of 5 million and now that's in, increased to 20 million with a, 10, uh, with a 10 million additional if and when required. So we only use that facility to buy businesses and then we pay it back out of either the profits of that business or uh, the combined business units. We do not need it for working capital because we generate that much cash. Regarding a placing, uh, the businesses I'm looking at, uh, the next sort of three or four businesses, I can't see us going to the market to raise any more money. Much of the disappointment of my brokers and people who want to come on board because we've got the cash to do it. Well, speaking about placings, there has been a secondary placing recently. Directors chose to sell en masse. How concerned should investors be when they see a collective sell from the boardroom? I, yeah, I was surprised, yeah, you know, unmatch is a good word because it was everybody, I didn't realise it. So first of all, if we go through them, I've got share options uh, under LTIP, which actually uh, we are, are entitled to exercise, same as John, same as Ken Ford. The biggest problem is, is I, that attracts a 47% tax bill on the shares. So I had to sh sell the shares to pay the tax. I didn't need to actually exercise the shares if I didn't want to, but Sunak's putting it up national insurance by two and a half percent from the 1st of April. So to save me and my company incurring, well, me one and a half, 1.25 percent and then 1.25, we decided to exercise it. So for me, you know, if the share price dropped to zero, I've made nothing apart from the revenues made about 600,000 uh, pounds in tax from me. And likewise with John, likewise with Ken. The other two, uh, uh, non-exec non directors, David and Isabel, they had options and they just wanted to cash in their options and that was it. Uh, for us three, you know, at the end of the day, it was just a tax bill and that's the reason I did it. So you and mentioned... Also, go on, there's Sarah. I'm saying you mentioned John there, just for people who aren't familiar with who you're talking about. This is John Abel, the Chief Correct. Financial Officer, but he's retiring. This was another of the more recent um, regulatory news statements. He's retiring and his, his words were of pride to be involved and a, a bit of reluctance to be leaving, actually. So what's his legacy and what kind of candidate can fill the boots? Because essentially, the Chief Financial Officer is your wingman stroke wingwoman. Uh, that's true. So we're going through the recruitment exercise at the moment um, for that. 
Um, he's a, a, a true sort of finance director. He's based uh, back at the office. Yeah, my job is on the road. I never, I probably see him once every week or a couple of weeks. So uh, we're just going through the exercise at the moment to say, what do we need? When John came on board, we had a market capitalization of about 50, 40, 50 million, something like that. We can turn over about 15 million. Well, this year we're going to turn over 45 to 50 million. We've got a market cap, like you say, the share price keeps going down because of the uh, economy we're in at the moment to about 170. So it's somebody who's going to grow it. So we're just talking about it at the moment. There's currently my role. I'm still an accountant by training. I still pay my subs every month. Um, but it's what is required to grow this business, really. Because for my job, it's really operational and deals. You know, and someone to actually uh, back at the base, probably go and see a lot of the subsidiaries, what, the, what we need to invest in the subsidiaries. That's their role. I think it's a great job for somebody. It really is. Free hand. So I, I'm just thinking about all the plates you're spinning. It's a bit like myself as a podcaster forgetting to switch off my phone there, which I apologise about. But there's so many considerations when running a business. You've got to be true to the purpose, be accountable to your investors, be accountable to your stakeholders, the environment, the climate. So how do you balance them all and what's the priority? No, I don't think there is a, a priority, really. Uh, my job is very straightforward, really. It's quite an easy job. Uh, it's just visiting the subs because at the end of the day, I'm the one who buys the businesses. So, of course, out of the 350 people within the business, I know everybody from the shop floor. So I have an open door approach, um, honesty, and that goes right the way through to the acquisition side. You know, when we're actually looking at the sort of ECG stuff and like that, I leave it to the accountant. I, the accountant, so I don't get involved in that. I like sort of going around the subs and uh, getting involved in the commercial side of the business. And also, I like speaking to shareholders. I think what I miss about the shareholders is things like Share Sock and Mellow. I used to like standing on stage in front of people and talking to them face to face. I find it very difficult to speak in, in Zoom. I don't think it's, uh, it's a fair sort of way to actually put across my sort of feelings about my business, which I'm passionate about. Well, Mike, I've got good news for you because there is the Master Investor Show on March the 19th, 2022, when you can meet, greet and elbow bump just as you used to. That's good. I'm pleased about that. So we'll meet face to face, Sarah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, until we meet in person on March the 19th, Mike Creedon, Chief Executive of SDI Group. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And you, Sarah. And you.